All right, everybody, welcome back to episode number 32 of Clicks and Bricks. My name is Ken. Today's sponsor, like always, is Hosterian. Um, we host websites, do co-location, WordPress help, a whole bunch of stuff. Check us out, H-O-S-T-I-R-I-A-N.com. Um, if you would like to join my text line community, 314-370-2871, I will never try to sell you anything on that text community. I would just send you fun tips and tricks, uh, motivational things, and, and stuff of that nature. So we'll jump right into today's podcast, using podcasts and video platforms to further your business. Uh, this is episode number 32, and our episodes are running at about um, about 30 minutes right now. So we're going to first start with Between the Cubicles, and that is a spare ticket for the space flight with Jeff Benzos auctioned off for $28 million. Would you go to space? I have every intention on going to space in my, not in my lifetime, but I have it in written down that when I die, I'm, I'm going to be cremated and I'm going to be put in a low Earth orbit, orbit um, balloon, like a weather balloon. They're going to send me up and that'll burst and then my ashes will just be in low orbit for eternity or until I guess the ozone just breaks down. I'm not sure which it is. If I had $28 million, I would spend it to go to space. Um, if I had $28 million, I'd probably spend it to hang out with Jeff Benzo, Bezos. I think he would probably teach me how to double it or triple it, right? So um, I, I, $28 million to go to space, what, what's it cost a person to go? Like, got to be pretty cheap, right? I think $28 million to go to space is probably a pretty inexpensive ticket considering what NASA spends to send four people to space. So um, way to go. I hope they get there. Right? Is it, I, it's probably not a guaranteed ticket either, right? It's probably if Amazon gets their shuttle together and if they launch, then you get to go. So um, that's a speculative bet if I've ever heard one. But I would, I think I'd probably buy a Musk ticket before I bought an Amazon ticket. But anyway, um, absolutely, I would go to space. Let me know what you would do if you want to go to space. I think everybody wants to go to space. I can't imagine not wanting to go to space. It seems like a pretty cool, pretty cool thing to me. Um, I've always wanted to go there. But anyway, uh, Bill asks, can you go into the reasons why you started your podcast and the process of what it took to get everything up and running? <clears throat> I'm not sure everything's up and running yet. Uh, so um, a couple of the tools that we use right out of the gate, OBS, and that's the letter OBS, Open Broadcast System, was a huge turning point for us. Um, standardizing on a single mod, single kind of camera, and we use GoPro. Uh, actually, we use old GoPros here. We're using GoPro 5s. Probably do a camera upgrade here in the next five to ten episodes, but right now we're still on GoPro 5s um, with some video capture cards going to a computer and then uh, OBS is doing a lot of that work. But I think we're probably going to up swap out from OBS to, what was the name of that, Sam? Streamlabs OBS. Um, I've been playing with it for the new podcast that I'm gonna be starting here soon. And it's got some features um, like this new bar that we have over here. It's got more of those kinds of features with also live alerts and things like that, all built in. You can do all that stuff with OBS just Streamlabs makes it a little bit easier. So a um, couple GoPros, we have a room, the knowledge on how to get everything up and set up. And then we use a program called Restream.io to go from OBS to Facebook and Twitch. When we go to Streamlabs, we won't need that because it's built into Streamlabs. The Restream is, is built into that product. and. Stream lasts like $150 for the year. So it, it seems like it's a pretty good um, investment there. Um, the cameras we're gonna move, uh, we wanna get the cameras that don't require the capture cards that can go straight over IP. Uh, I forget the protocol for that. Do you remember what it is? It's like NDR or something like that. It's a specific kind of video protocol that allows you to stream directly to OBS and bypass the video capture cards, which we have good video capture cards now, but we've gone through a couple of cheapies in the past um, there. And then I still think our audio isn't probably 100%, but we've got, we're using the Snowball, the, what is it, Blue Yeti? We're using the Blue Yeti. I have a Snowball. We had some bigger microphones in the beginning. Um, 
I don't think there was the quality that we were looking for. And we keep, you know, pasting, taping up uh, the stuff in the room to get rid of echoes. So that's been a big challenge. Why did, um, why did we start the podcast? So the reason we started the podcast, one is hopefully to help our customers um, get the knowledge on our, our clients on how to get uh, things done We're using technology in their business. We've kind of ebb and flowed through through what, what our podcast is, and we're getting back to more technical stuff, which I like. Um, that, that was the reason for the end users, right? To help them use current technologies to run their business and grow their businesses. The other part, the kind of the selfish part is we know that we have to create a lot of content for our company and having a podcast was one way, just one way, that maybe we could get five or six clips a week to have those and put them out on different platforms. So the podcast was the easiest way that we knew how to create a bunch of content quickly. So we get you know our, our, our entire audio platform, we get the video for YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, uh, in link, or LinkedIn, all those different places. And then we can take that, chop it up into smaller pieces and then have micro content. So we got big content and little content all from one uh, couple hours of labor to get the podcast together each week. Uh, actually, it's more than a couple hours. It's probably about 10 hours of labor each week to do this half hour episode. So um, but 10 hours and we might end up, sometimes we'll end up with a lot of content out of the podcast. Sometimes we'll end up with just the podcast uh, content itself. So it's, it's kind of hit and miss depending on the topics and depending on how engaged we are um, in that podcast to, to be able to break those up into smaller pieces of content. So, but it's a, it's a fun way to get content. It's an easy, not an easy way to get content, but it's easier than every day thinking about, Oh, how am I going to get five new pieces of content? If you do a weekly podcast, hopefully if you do it correctly, you have five or 10 pieces of content for the next week. And that helps you get through, um, with all of your other, uh, branding activities. So, um, it seems to work pretty well for us. Then you can use also use that podcast to which we're getting ready to start implementing is bringing guests onto your podcast. So um, guest spotlights, and that could be you know people that you want to do business with. It could be vendors you want to do business with, or clients you want to potential clients, or clients that you're currently doing business with to help them get exposure. Right. So once you start creating this world um, of your podcast, then you can use those different tools. Uh, for different agendas and, and a lot of different agendas. One it can be new, getting new clients. It could be helping existing clients. It could be uh, creating exposure for vendors and things like that, or even helping a vendor out. So uh, all reasons why we started getting everything up and running. We don't have everything up and running yet. So, and we're on episode number 32. It's constantly changing and evolving. We find, hey, this is better. Uh, we like this better. We're going to swap it out or... Um, sometimes we think we're going to like something better. We swap it out and then go back to what we had. So <clears throat> I think the most important thing there is to remember this is a journey. You don't know all the answers on day one, but the most important thing is just get started, right? If you have an idea, you want to run with it, just get started. Your first episodes are probably going to suck. Um, you might even have some boring episodes right there in the middle, right in your, in your, in your main go. Um, but just keep pushing forward. So then Bill, I hope that helps you out. And we're going to move on to Kim's question. Kim asks, am I currently running? I am currently running my own business selling jewelry in California. I am struggling in sales at the moment, and I've been looking for new ways to bring more traffic to my product and website. Do you think investing time into making YouTube videos, a podcast, a blog, or other media is worth it? Can I make, can it make that much of a difference? If I was selling jewelry online today, I would absolutely be making videos nonstop. Um, and you see that today, right? I mean, I'm not, I, I don't wear any jewelry at all. Um, I don't even wear watches, right? So, but I do occasionally see, I've got friends that um, have started these um, kind of like Avon brand where they resell this jewelry in these, these groups. And they're on YouTube or they're on TikTok or on Facebook you know, doing these presentations and, and showing their jewelry. Um, 
you know, I, I would like to know a little more if you're selling the jewelry, if you're just reselling the jewelry, what kind of quality it is, are you making the jewelry? If you're making the jewelry, I would absolutely do a, t a YouTube channel on how to make your, on how I make my jewelry, right? Really show them the quality and the time behind what it is that you're creating. I think that would be really interesting and you could help other creators, but then also you help building your brand and exposure. Um, TikTok is, there's probably a bunch of different ways to do that. A podcast, I think you could probably do a podcast on jewelry. What kind of jewelry goes with, with different kinds of skin tones? Um, you know, how to properly maintain your jewelry, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, I wish I knew more about jewelry, but I, and I don't, but I do think that there's a lot of different tactics and strategies that you could use in video and podcast to help, um, with that jewelry, even like, uh, jewelry shows. So I know that people have like, uh, the Tupperware parties. They also have jewelry parties. So you could literally do one of those jewelry parties and bring a camera and do little TikTok videos of people putting the jewelry on and really admiring it. Oh my God, look at that bling, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think it would be absolutely would make a difference, but what won't make a difference is if you do three videos and then say, oh, this doesn't work and throw it away. You're going to have to commit to a platform. You're going to have to learn about that platform, spend 10, 20 hours learning about how to do videos, what tools do you need? for that specific platform, who the audience is on that specific platform and start making content for them, right? And that will, over time, start building your brand and, and solidifying you as a industry leader and then bring you more business. It absolutely works. It does take time. It's not a next day kind of thing. There's no, there's no tip for tat when it comes to creating video for uh, building your business but it, it does help and it, over time it, it does snowball effect and, and get you into that growth period. So, uh, Kim, I hope that helped. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. If you want to talk more in depth, like if it's costume jewelry versus high end jewelry, high ticket item jewelry, things like that. Um, you know, we can get in, into more detailed context, but yes, video will help you. Absolutely. If, if nothing else, you should have a video, of each piece of jewelry on YouTube for your website, right? People want to see the jewelry on a person. They don't want to see it just in a box. What would it look like draped on your neck? What would it look like on your wrist? Those kinds of things. Um, I know I don't wear watches because I hate how they feel on my skin, but if I do, it's always going to be a really nice uh, cloth or leather band, none of the metal bands, because I, I don't like metal on my skin at all. Um, so it would be nice to know like, hey, this watch, you know, and be honest, 100%. I love the way this watch looks, but it pinches the hair on my on my arm, right? Tell them that kind of stuff because they'll they'll trust you if you're being honest. If you're you know if you're just trying to sell your product and say, oh, everything I have is amazing and there's no flaws with anything, you're not going to be trusted that well. So be honest with every piece, what you like, what you don't like about it. If there's something you don't like about it, um, and and just keep keep making content, and put it out there. Um, Joe, Joey, 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 my son's name, Joe. So I'm not used to calling people Joey, but all right, Joey, do you think that podcasting is the future of content marketing? I feel every business should be starting one. What are your thoughts on how content can help your business or brand? Um, I don't think podcasting alone is the future of content marketing. It is one major component. Um, and when I say one major component, I mean, because it's, it's a, it's a great way to get your, your message out. And when people are listening to podcasts, they're doing it passively. So if you're creating something that is at least somewhat entertaining, you have a pretty good chance that if you're in somebody's niche, that they're going to put you on in the car and listen to you while they're driving in traffic and things like that. So they really have more time to absorb what you're saying and what your message is when instead of like a short clip video on TikTok or Facebook or um, LinkedIn. So it's a great way to get longer messages out, get in front of people, stay in front of people for a long time, keep them entertained and show them about your products, your, your services and things like that. So um, I don't know what the future of content marketing necessarily is right now podcasts are going to play a big part of it 
Video is going to play a big part of it. NFTs, I think are going to play a big part of it. Um, live events, I think, are going to be huge. So recording live events and then rebroadcasting them. What uh, Tony Robbins has been doing this for years. I can't believe more people haven't you know followed suit. But uh, you know, doing a live event, video recording that event, and then selling, distributing the the, the product after the fact. So podcast, yes. Selling from the stage, yes. Quick clips about your products, yes. I think the holy grail of content marketing is how-to videos. Uh, Bob Vila is, uh, you know, one of the best at this. So uh, he's been making content videos, how-to videos for since I was a kid, or even um, Bob Ross, right? How to paint, right? His holy grail on building his brand, and you can't buy his paintings today, but if you could, I promise you they would go for a lot, a lot of money. So how-to videos, I think, are the holy grail of content marketing, especially if you can show people how to not use your product. You build a lot of trust, you help somebody out, and then chances are they're gonna get frustrated with it because you know I watch how to do plumbing all the time videos, and I've learned my lesson finally. I don't ever try anymore, but I used to try and then call the plumber. Now I still watch it and I go, yeah, I can't do that. And then I call the plumber, right? So um, how-to videos, I think, are the number one way to do content marketing and get it out there. Um, podcasts, I think, would be a close second, and live events would be a third in my, in my mind. And the reason live events would be a third is only because they're challenging to do, right? It, it takes, it's a, it's a big overhaul to get the live show up and running. We are halfway through today's show, man. These half hours just rock and fly, don't they? So we're going to do this week in tech history. This week is 6-15, June 15th. <clears throat> the first two video games are copyrighted. That's Atari's Asteroids and Lunar Lander become the first two video games to be registered with the U.S. Copyright Office. Wow. Asteroids, I really thought, was Asteroids before Space Invaders? I don't know. Um, I guess it was. Maybe, or maybe it wasn't copywritten. I don't know. But my literally my first like Atari game was Space Invaders, and I absolutely loved it. But we played Asteroids a lot. Uh, Asteroids wasn't as good without the the toggle, right? The old school remote control with the stick and the button didn't do great for Asteroids. You really needed that paddle, which was also great for Super Breakout and Breakout. But uh, it's amazing how far games have come. In um, that was 1980, so was that 40 years ago? Holy shit! 1980 was 40 years ago. I was five. Um, Wow, that's, I think that's a little earlier than I thought. So, anyway, I was five years old when this came out. I remember playing Asteroids on my Atari when I was a kid. It was a lot of fun. It was the coolest thing ever before Atari. Um, I, I don't know, I was probably 10 years old when I got an Atari, 10 or 11. Um, you know, I had a Commodore 64 and an old basic computer um, in my house. But, so, yeah, it was pretty cool stuff. Congrat, Thank you, Atari. Thank you, Atari, for everything you brought us in this world. Without Atari, I don't know where we would be. Um, I think Steve Jobs worked at Atari, too, didn't he? Did he freelance for Atari? Waz and, Waz and Jobs both worked for Atari? Right. I, I, I think in the movie, at least, they, they were doing some consulting work for Atari. So... Um, it's, it's crazy to think that, the, you know, those juggernauts of technology came from what is now basically a defunct company, right? Atari's not even around anymore, are they? I don't think. Yeah, Steve Jobs did work for Atari. Steve Jobs did work for Atari. Awesome. Well, that's uh, pretty fun. Back in that time, right? Yeah. So, cool. And thank you, Steve Jobs. Rest in peace. But anyway, moving on. Uh, that's a that's a fun a fun topic. I wish I wish I knew more about Atari's history. I don't. I was a kid, and by the time I got into technology, Atari was a thing of the past, and Nintendo had pretty much dominated that market. But Chad asks, I am currently in startup phase of my business and trying to prioritize my media content efforts. I plan to eventually do a podcast, YouTube videos, and written blog. 
what should I start with prioritize first? You're already struggling to make content, start a podcast, right? Because if you start a podcast, you have the video, you have the audio, and you can pay an intern five bucks an hour through Upwork to transcribe your podcast. So you get, that's the beautiful thing is you're doing multiple things all at one time. So it's the easiest way to get all that stuff done at once. And you can get it all done with five to 10 hours of effort if you're gonna do a 30 minute podcast or even an hour, depending on what your content is, what your topic is. I'm assuming that you know your topic pretty well, so you don't you don't have to do a lot of research. You do have to start the following. You have to ask questions. You go to Quora, get get you know questions from people, go over them. I recommend having one or two people help you out with your podcast. I am um, on my next podcast. I'm journeying out. I'm going to do it all by myself. I don't, I don't have any any support on that one, and but I've learned a lot from this podcast. So. Having some help is a huge, huge benefit. Um, while you're up there and you're trying to do the podcast, you're talking to stuff, you don't need to be thinking about technical issues with your with your switch or your cam or anything like that. You want somebody handling all those things for you. Um, the other thing that I would say is if you don't have anybody direct and you're just going to videotape it and then do the podcast, you can use the service. We use a service called Bloxy. And... We do the podcast, and when it's all done, we send it to Floxy, and they do the edits, and they do some stuff. With OBS, where Sam's got it now, it's not as important to use Floxy because we have some of these animations and cool borders and stuff that we can do live. But if we didn't have help doing it, and we just wanted to have you know just a, a, a camera shooting me, then we would have to send that to Floxy. And in the beginning, we were sending it to Floxy every single week. Um but Floxy, then you can send it to them and they're like unlimited jobs per month for 400 bucks, just one job at a time, but you send them the job and they do it. But you can video the, your conversation or your interview with somebody. You can send it to Floxy and say, hey, can you edit this? You know, put um, graphics in at these places when I say phone numbers, put the phone numbers up. And can you also give me a transcription of this podcast? So you have the written blog, you've got the video, and you have the audio. So you have three pieces of content out of one podcast. And if you can break that into micro content for this podcast, we take each question and we break it into micro content. So we have, we have one 30 minute video, one 30 minute audio piece and five individual audio pieces and five individual um, videos. So if, if you're looking to prioritize, and you're looking to get the most bang for your buck on how to do it. I think podcast is definitely the way to go. If you don't want to do podcasts, then how to videos, how to use your product is the very next thing to do. You are doing it all the time. Um, if you want to go really crazy, you can start a, um, what they call a lifestyle, um, YouTube channel, which is then just record yourself throughout the day, doing the things that you do inside your company and then push that out onto YouTube a little bit different, more challenging to do, um, because you're gonna have to get cameras all over the place. You're gonna have to remember to hit record, but, and you'll definitely need a video editing service if you're gonna go that path or a video editing person on staff. So those are some ideas that you could use to get started. I really love the lifestyle stuff. Whenever I go into, when I deep dive into YouTube, I always end up on lifestyle videos at some point in my, in my YouTube right now. My YouTube is pretty cluttered with cryptocurrency and NFTs, um, but I'm sure I'll get somewhat bored of that and then start bringing back off into motivational speakers and lifestyle videos. But um, that's my little bit of effort. Um, biggest bang for your buck, podcast, how-to videos, or lifestyle brand video, and, and go from there. Good luck on your startup. It's... Uh, it's a rough road and it's, it's sometimes it's a great road. Sometimes it's a lonely road, but, uh, keep it up. Good job. Thank you for, for going out there and trying it and giving it your best shot. It's uh wildly rewarding whenever you make even the smallest successes. So keep up the great work. Uh, before we get to Rick's question, uh, today's episode is also sponsored by inlink.com rapport made easy. Go to inlink.com and sign up for your free account. Absolutely no charge. You'll have all your social media profiles in one location and it, it's got all your business profiles too. So it's got links to your Stripe, links to your LinkedIn, 
business profile along with your personal profile so you can really build up your profile and link to your website. And then you'll have one link that you can give to everybody that has all of your social media profiles in one place. It's really a great tool. And if you want to get that badge verified checkbox, it's, uh, it's really, really affordable. So last question, Rick, Rick asks, do you think you should start your business podcast YouTube channel with the intent to make money or the intent of building trust for your brand? I think it depends on what you want to do. If you wanted to create, so this is a business podcast for YouTube channel. You should do that with the intent of building trust for your brand. If you go out um, of the gate for a YouTube or podcast channel and your intent is to make money on that YouTube channel, I think people are going to see through you so quickly. Um, unless you want to go like super, super cheesy with it. Like, what? wait, there's more. Um, if you want to do that, like straight hardcore sales and make it entertaining that you're selling them uh, more like a QVC or something like that. I think you, some people could pull it off. I don't think I could. Um, and if you go that path, I think if you go that path, you have to own it 100%. Be a little cheesy with it. Be in your face. Go for it 100%. Um, it takes a special kind of person to do that and do it good. And, and, and pull it off. So if you're that kind of guy or lady, this is Rick, I'm assuming you're a guy, um, go for it, right? And give it a try. What the worst that can happen is that people hate you. Um, and if people hate you, then some people are gonna love you and probably buy your stuff. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a riskier game. For me, it's, a, it's for building trust and, and brand because trust and brand ends up being money in the future, right? And it ends up being more sustainable funds and more sustainable business model long-term. So especially in my business, which is web hosting, it requires a significant amount of trust, right? People are trusting me in some in my business or this business, not my business, our business, um, with their website. In a lot of cases that is, or not, not just their website, their technology. So. If you buy co-location from us, you could be an airport, you could be a hospital, you could be any kind of different business. And you're trusting that we're always online, that our generators are always fueled up, that our batteries are always working, that our air conditioners are always running, that we always have staff here. So, I mean, at the end of the day, yes, I sell web hosting and, and co-location and dedicated servers and virtual servers and private clouds. But at the end of the day, what we're selling is trust. And, and trust in the team that we're here, that our engineers can pull off what we say we can, and that we provide the services that we say we can provide. And we do that at a great price um, to the end user. And, you know, it's just, it's, to me, it's all about trust and brand. So, and in St. Louis, Hosterian is a brand that's been around for 21 years. We've been worldwide for the, the entire time too, but, uh, you know, our brand is definitely stronger in the St. Louis community than it is everywhere else. But, um, I think that's a decent question, Rick. I think you know the answer before you even asked it and you want it to, you know, in business, there's this, I need money now kind of situation. And that's always the case. You always have to make payroll. You always have to pay the insurance bill. Um, you know, the medical insurance is due and you got to get it paid and oh, this thing's broke over here. I got to get it fixed. So you always have this pressure to bring in money and you want to, everything that you do needs to be revenue generating but take some time out, set some time aside for branding because long-term, if you don't brand your company, you won't exist, right? Um, every big marketer that I know that I listen to, you know, says, you know, um, can't think of his name off the top of my head. Gary Vee's always talking about brand, uh, but I got another guy, um, can't think of his name, always says, you know, if you're boring, you're gonna go out of business. So boring, equals out of business. I don't necessarily disagree with him. I don't hundred percent agree with him either because sometimes trust, unfortunately is a little bit boring for me. So, um, you know, it's hard to be exciting and elaborate and also gain trust. If you want to look at the difference between Amazon's marketing and, uh, for Amazon's AWS marketing specifically, very, um, conservative, whereas GoDaddy, is you know considered the cheap hosting provider and they have you know uh, race cars and uh, danica patrick is that her name danica 
Danica Patrick, I think, um, is the race car driver. Um, you know, gorgeous female athlete that races cars. And GoDaddy goes a little more on the uh, wild side for their marketing. But both substantial companies, both, you know, the two largest hosting companies in the world. So um, build your brand, build trust, and the money will follow. I promise you. That's it for today's show, everybody. Episode number 32 of Clicks and Bricks. If you want to contact me directly, 314-370-2871. Ask me any question, as wild as it one you want to be, um, or as conservative as you want to be. It doesn't really matter. I'll do my best to answer all the questions that come my way. And I promise you, if you join that text line community, I will never try to sell you anything on that text line. So that's it for today, folks. Hit the-